Today, our conversation is going to be a bit of a, a dance, and I'm going to lay out some stuff that's basically just me. This is just me. Is it belief? I don't know. It's just my latest best guess of what's going on. You know, the deep end is really about metaphysics, and we've tried to look at those things and processes life cannot do without. But if we keep going back, I mean, if we just keep going back, something happens. We've talked about being becoming life and life becoming self-aware, conscious and then self-aware. We've talked about the three essential processes of semi-permeability, differentiation and complexification and how they work together to each be, create new orders. But the metaphysics goes back to why. Why? Once you have the physics, what's the bigger picture? What's it encapsulated in? How do we talk about that? And that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to lay out some stuff that I, I hope I'm just not <laughs> too far out. But I hope I'm just far out that we're all reaching in the same direction. You know, one of my favorite uh, metaphysics is uh, a, uh, uh, I put in musical terms. And that's where the Godhead is this composer that creates this amazing piece of music. And then he sends that to the next level, which is Elohim. Elohim are Elohim is the plural name of God. There are all these little sparks of God, if you will, and they publish this music. And once the music's been published, it goes to the archangels. And the archangels then, each in their own direction, call together the choirs of angels and distribute the music. And then the archangels, each, compo each conducting the choirs of angels, sing this amazing one song called the Universe. I like that. I like that. Although it just doesn't fit with our reality today, does it? It's a, it's a great metaphor, if you will. So if the fundamental metaphysic is really about the questions of why anything at all? That's the big why. What is before being? Well, I'm going to lay out my best guess. Now, if you go to the Bible and you look at the, the rabbis' arguments over the last couple thousand years over that, in the beginning, God created. The argument is over, did God create out of nothing or did God create out of chaos? What was this? And, uh, you know, it just creates a whole different understanding of it. And if chaos, where did the chaos come from? So if nothing, how can we even think about it? You see, to me, nothingness is the doorway into this question. But I want to start by, you know, my brother and I, we used to sit back to back and have conversations. He'd be on mathematics and I'd be on LSD. And we would just have these great conversations. And in that time, I was very young. I was in my early 20s. I had a spirit guide, and she was amazing. Whether meditating or tripping, she would take me places. I would ask. I felt a little like William Blake in Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And the spirit guide one time said, where do you want to go? And I said, you know, I just read about the expanding universe and What's it expanding into? What's on the other side of the expansion? Can you take me to the edge of the universe? And so, we bang, bang, boom, she takes me to the edge of the universe. And I said, I want to stick my head out. She goes, what? I said, yeah, I want to stick my head out and see what we're expanding into. And sure enough, she said, let me hold your feet. I stick my head out, and we're in a vineyard. And we are one grape. My universe is one grape in a vineyard that went on in all directions, infinitely, it seemed. And I went, what? And it was only later that I began reading about uh, uh, multiverses that, that in the beginning, it wasn't just this universe that was created, but this universe is one bubble on a foam. Like if you look at the, the foam on top of a beer, we're one bubble and the foam is going in all directions. What? Now it's interesting when we took, talk about the fundamental question, um, because in the West, that question first reared its head in a guy named Lieb Leibniz. He's the guy who created uh, calculus and the binary system, which is the root of all computing. And that was 300 years ago. And his conclusion was 
God wanted the universe, so that's what happened. Uh, and he, he basically said that nothing is out of reach, as the mind is rooted in, in thingness. You can't, it can't do it. And of course, over time, there have emerged these, these quantum views, which go back to uh, chaos, that there was some uh, gravity in this quantum vacuum, that uh, uh, some kind of uh, different virtual particles flitting into and out of being. Well, maybe. But it's interesting when you go east, nothing need not be thought of to be experienced. You find the word sunyata, which can mean emptiness or void or nothingness. Uh, and we can't talk about nothing existing. Think about it. <laughs> nothing is where nothing exists, so how do you talk about it as if it's something? You have to create almost a an imaginary imaginary world. I think there was a book called Flat uh, Flat World or Flat Lines. I read it, gosh, fifty years ago about a two dimensional world where somebody was preaching about the third dimension, uh, <clears throat> and people wouldn't believe it. In my view, something arises from nothing. And we can't think of nothing, so let's imagine it. Let's let's pretend we're we're Hindus or Buddhists and think of nothingness. Okay, it, it just presuppose it in your mind. Now I'm also going to say that there's a, a a a term that has reared its head everywhere. It's called "as above, so below." So keep that in mind as we go on. Now. If you listen to previous podcasts, we've talked about the trajectory of the universe uh, towards self-awareness, and self-awareness is about justice, and justice itself is love shared. Think about it. Now, what we're talking about is crazy wisdom here. This is something that the West has been left out of uh, in the way of thinking, because the West has seen the universe as a puzzle and not something uh, of which we're rising out of necessarily, uh, and that we can reroute ourselves in the nothingness in which it rises out of. <clears throat> I've had a chant that I've used for years. It's called the one inside the many waking to the wonder. And this is very Vedantic thinking, because what we're going to do is go before uh, beyond, <laughs> we're going to go beyond before. Now, nothing at its deepest nature is what I would call love and justice. This is my best guess. Okay, now I want you to think of uh, step down transformer. We've talked about that, the trajectory of the universe. Uh, the, the step down transformers are everything that starts, you know, if we're thinking string theory from vibrating strings all the way to planets. Uh, in our consciousness, the step-down transformers are stories and myths, math. Any way to express it, that is part of what it is being stepped down. We have to look at the human experience and go, what's it really about? And it seems to me from previous podcasts, and I'll say it right here, that the trajectory of the universe really is justice. It's trying to work out this love that's happening everywhere, that's trying to make its way in. And there are so many things that are challenging that, but that's not what we're going today. So I want you to think of before everything is pure nothingness, pure symmetry, pure balance, sunyata, pure love. Yet, as anybody who's experienced it, love without an object to love it almost hurts. And I think maybe maybe that's why suffering is part of it. Because what I see happening is whatever nothingness is not or is, something upset the symmetry of it, which created the first movement, which created this plethora, a froth, a foam of possibilities that came into play. Trillions and trillions of songs are sung, and each is a universe unto itself. Our one song here. There are other songs that are very different from ours. Here we can see that if Planck's length, Planck's length was any different, we would not be here. 
There would not be any being or life or consciousness. Something in this universe allowed it to be plowed, to be grown into self-awareness. And I'm going back to my chant, the one inside the many waking to the wonder. Because that's my best guess. This song, this universe, is its deeper nature, which is before and after and everything, it's trying to arise and manifest. And that's what we're part about. Now, I will say that if you go to Sunyata, it really depends on the context. Uh, if, if emptiness uh, is in Buddhism is different than nothingness, uh, just a fine distinction. Uh, emptiness is basically saying everything uh, is beyond our ability to conceive it. Whatever's happening and whatever our mind is thinking of it, that probably ain't it. And so let go of that stuff and empty yourself so you can experience it head on. But I see emptiness as a doorway to nothingness and nothingness as a doorway to the metaphysic of such grand proportion. So in my mind, nothing is pure love and it is upset by the mere fact that it has nothing to reach out and touch. And here, you know, an elder woman of the native tribes, I think she was uh, Salish or something, I can't remember. I asked her what reality was and she said it is the great touching. And I think that that's it. We are inside the great touching. Nothing itself, the oneness of being, seeks to touch, to be expressed. The one inside the many, waking to the wonder. You know, in Be Here Now by Baba Ram Das, he put a chant in there. Gate, gate, paragate, parasam gati, bodhisvaha. Which means, gone, gone, gone beyond, gone beyond, beyond. Hail the goer. And I will say, to entertain such thoughts, you know, why anything at all? I think it allows us to touch the untouchable by merely entertaining the thoughts, by merely engaging ourselves in seeking to root ourselves into something beyond ourself. Uh, I think that as above, so below gives us a good analog to hang everything on. Uh, I think that's why Jesus used agricultural and plant metaphors so much, because he was saying, look, this is what's happening to us too. We're growing. We are growing beings. So that's my best guess. Uh, it really looks to me, if I keep pulling on the threads, that nothingness, whatever it is or isn't, Something upsets it, and in that moment, something flits. Maybe it's some potential for a virtual particle or something, and the whole symmetry is upset. And again, I don't know how many universes there are, but I think there's more than I can imagine. I still remember sticking my head out of our expanding universe and seeing that we're just one grape in a vineyard of infinite grapes. Now, I just laid out a lot. Uh, that's my best guess, and um, <laughs> I'll be damned if I know. <laughs> so uh, my my ho co-hosts, as usual, are Bob Hayes coming from Florida, Marianne Ruddest coming from Spokane Valley. My name is Red Hawk. We are at the deep end, and today we are in the deep crevice, I think, uh, because I think about this all the time, and I go, it's unthinkable. Uh, but I've learned in a, in a rational universe, there is still plenty of room for incomprehensible wonder. So, Bob, I'll start with you. What say you with my best guess? Well, um, I didn't find a lot to disagree with. But uh, then again, you know, when you're talking about nothing, uh, there's nothing to disagree with. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've always found in, in my own attempt to, to grasp what's going on, and when I think of, of, of nothing, the beyond, however the term is, 
I always break it into two words, no thing. And by that, I mean, we can't define it. In our world that we live in, the reality around us, everything is defined, everything is labeled. It's part of the way the mind works. It's part of the way consciousness works. It's part of the way language works. But when you talk about before the beginning, before being, the only thing we can say is that it's nothing we can define. It's no thing. And as soon as we accept that, then we can step back and start trying to better define what's going on in our, in our reality. And I, I agree with, with one of the things you said in terms of something coming from this nothingness, like a flip, like a, 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 a light switch being flicked or something. But that implies that all of the potential for what's in our reality that we're existing in is there prior to it coming into existence. All of those potentials are there. But once they come into existence, then we can start to, to, to grasp them and start to see, well, what rules are they following? And that's where you get into terms like justice, into terms like balance, into terms like as above, so below, which is a perfect definition of systems theory. Because we find in systems theory that everything in, in every system exists analogously to, to each other. So that the system that we find in a city is similar to the system that we find in a cell, as above, so below. And those are the things, those potentialities didn't just come out as potentialities, they came out with certain rules. And that's what science has been trying to grasp since it began. What yeah. are these rules? And that's what and the, the, the whole being, life, and consciousness that I've tried to encapsulate. It, exactly. But being, life, and consciousness occurs because of certain rules, like balance, like valence, like you know, uh, positive and negative in, in electricity, like, like chemical bonds, like all of those things that we've been able to discover are the rules that the universe follows in order for them, for being conscious, being life and consciousness to exist. Yeah. And that's where I find it exciting. It's not, as, as the Tao has said, you, you can't talk about the Tao. Anyone who tries to talk about it is being a fool. So just let that go and start trying to talk about what emerges from the Tao. What emerges from nothingness yeah. is... And now we're in the world of 10,000 things. And I want to go back. I want to give Marianne a chance because we've... But uh, I want us to keep at the level of nothingness. We've All our podcasts have been about the rules, about the processes... I want to go back before that, and that's what I'm trying to get at. Things we cannot think about, and yet poetry and dance, all of these things are step-down transformers trying to touch what cannot be touched. So I'm not going to just, I'm, I'm going to cut you off, Bob, because I, I, our time is, is going short, and I want to hear what Mary Ann's response uh, to it is. Well, I was actually um, listening intently to both of you, and um a couple of things. Um, you mentioned nothing being equal to pure love, right? And, and so the idea that out of pure love or out of nothingness came everything. And um, to me, there were several things that, that just kind of came into my mind. And it, it's like a, a Zen koan, right? Where you are holding opposites and and they're merging. The world of opposites have to merge in order to even be able to kind of go beyond anything that is. Because once we start to think in the world of opposites, then that's when we're, we're into what's arisen from all of this, right? Um, and... You know, to, to think about why anything at all, it's it's a mystery, it's mysterious. And um, when you were talking about 
um, the metaphors, the the chorus of angels and the song. And and it occurred to me, um, as you said that, that we are a song. Each one of us and each individual is a song being sung by this ineffable, um, unknowable um, source that connects all of us together. And, you know, if, and if we are all going back to your, um, your statement, Red Hawk, about if we're all one inside the many, uh, and so we're all these songs, then it, every single one of us has to reach a certain place to reach justice. So until we're all united, until we're all recognizing this unified place of um, connection that underlies all of us, then that's when something will be realized. I don't know what. I mean, I don't know what we're we're heading towards. I have no I'd love to be able to stick my head outside that universe and see where where we're heading. Um and it's it's so interesting that you use that the terms of the grapes. There's a book out there that um where a um a, a psychologist or psychiatrist um, did some past life regressions on people. And I can't remember the name of the book, but I'll, I'll, I'll think of it. And he asked people where they were in the in-between, in-between lives. And there were people talking about these clusters of grapes, that they were part of these clusters. And um, when you said that, I, I was just like, oh, my God. Um, I, I've avoided that book because it's like, I don't want to think about that. <laughs> so, um, and, and so, I don't know. I just think it's, it's, it's fascinating. And, you know, I think it's just... Bob, you said science is trying to figure out what these laws are. And I think also philosophy is trying to to figure this out as well. All of the sciences, you know, together are trying to figure this out because we have this insatiable curiosity about who we are and what we are, or most of us, or some of us do anyway. Um, <laughs> others um, can can live in this and be content um, which is, and I think I mentioned this last time, and sometimes an envious place to be because sometimes these thoughts take me in, down roads that um, um, are quite interesting. But anyway, um, so I don't know that I said anything at all other than, yeah, it's a mystery and, and um, we're living in it. And, and here's the thing. <laughs> Both of you brought up something that's very important. All the things that Bob's talking about, the 10,000 things, each one of them is a thread that is tied to the Tao. And we can't know the Tao, but in the world of 10,000 things, I mean, Lao Tzu obviously caught drift of something deeper uh, from these 10,000 things. Science, everything we discover is another thread that gives us a little insight into maybe what happened before. I mean... Uh, 50 years ago, we weren't seeing movies about multiverses uh, and, and things like that. And we're, we're seeing the, the generation and propagation of ideas. And each idea is, again, rooted in something. And when we start pulling on all the threads uh, and putting them together, we see, start seeing what they're woven into. What is this nothingness? How is it woven, and how does it give rise to all of this? In terms of what you were saying, Marianne, in terms of each of us being a song, I think the universe is working on creating every iteration it possibly can on every front. So it's taking all the elements from the elemental table and creating every kind of, you know, Thing that you can imagine, every kind of planet, every kind of sun on this earth. You know, someone uh, wrote on uh, Facebook, uh, God said uh, he created man and woman. He created them only or just as man as woman. And I, I responded, you think God is done with us? I think we're, we're working on more iterations of everything. And that's part of it. And every iteration 
is connected. And what that connective tissue is, we don't really know. We don't understand uh, what's it called when uh, particles get together and they, they find a spin and you can take them light years apart and when one spins, the other spins exactly like it. Uh, uh, it's Entanglement. Yeah, yeah. It, it's an, an, an entanglement. Where there, are, there are things about nothing that are still being revealed to us. And we know, we've known for thousands of years that nothing is whatever, what, you know, it doesn't exist. As a matter of fact, it used to be called, reality used to be called uh, that, those things that exist, made of those things. And yet now we got dark matter, so everything is coming out of stuff that doesn't exist. And we're, we're, we're learning over and over. And I think pulling on these threads is everything because what it reveals to us is the deeper nature of consciousness. And perhaps nothing is just pure consciousness. And consciousness itself uh, wants to touch. And we're coming to the end, Bob, so uh, let this be your final comments. Okay, good, because I've been trying to hold on to this thought, and, and it's difficult. <laughs> because they just want to go on about their business wherever they go. But uh, I want to extend the metaphor of, of each of us being a song. And I think that's a great metaphor. And I think that we can define love as that force which enable us to harmonize our songs. And justice is the measure of that harmony. Now, I don't know if that thought means anything, but that's what came to me when I was listening to the two of you. And uh, it, it felt pretty good. <laughs> You know, as someone who's still working on piano, uh, dissonance becomes a passing tone. And it's really interesting because I think some of us are just passing tones. <laughs> and some of us are creating dissonance and we're trying to figure out how to resolve the progression into something that's not dissonant. Marianne, final comments? Or we are becoming, um, we're finding the the notes that we harmonize with and um, i i love what you said bob and i think that is a great way to to end this because um i think that's that's just perfect um yeah that's all i have i love it you know i i, I just switched out some of my song stuff uh, we got to get coming up and i put in cosmic dance and it's exactly what we're talking about you know uh, it's all happening. Happen with it. You know what I mean? Uh, and how do we do that? And one of my fav favorite lines is, uh, and we're dancing and singing in harmony. And then, of course, we go, harmony, and it gets real loud. And I love harmony. That's what turned me on to music. Um, so where do we go next? <laughs> Say what? <Dance. laughs> oh, I'm just showing my Beatles t-shirt in terms of harmony. I love it. I love it. Let's dance. Let's dance. You know, there's both a solution and an enemy that are the same. And it's very interesting. If you look through human history, you see it. And it's diversity. You see, when you look around, why does everything work? It's because of the diverse nature of it. You know, it's the color diversity, it's foreground, background, it's all the different pieces that fit in this, this happening that is our ecosystem, the biosphere, the human uh, life is attached to here on planet Earth. And yet, diversity is one of the biggest fears of the human family. Over and over, we can see how diversity becomes an enemy. Right now, in America, diversity is becoming an enemy. I, I, I've been saying lately that the right wing uh, fears diversity the same way that Islamic fundamentalism uh, fears modernity. Diversity. It's both what we need and what we're most afraid of because it means seeing the different as valuable. My friends, until next time. 
blessings. And may the oneness of nothingness be all over you.